American Dream and Promise Act of 2021, there are exciting things in there that you may want to know about. Emily, um, I thought the Democrats are only favoring unlawfully present people, the DACA kids who came here under 15, and they're only doing for those people. Is it true, or is it that they're favoring, you know, the DACA bill always, I mean, when what was presented before, when they gave the EADs, they only gave it to the people who are who came legal, who might have come legally or illegally, but they came here when they were under 15, and they are unlawfully present in this country, but previously they exempted the people who are legally present in this country. So this green card provisions, which the House is about to pass this week, does it include only unlawfully present, or does it include anything else? It does actually include legal dreamers this time around, which is the first really? time that they've been included in this Dream Act type legislation. Uh, so it's a big benefit. So yes, all the press is only talking about um, the Dream Act and the DACA kids and the uh, TPS um, applicants being able to get a green card under this American Dream and Promise Act, which is HR 6. It's got 158 co-sponsors in the House. It's supposed to be voted on this week it's not going to be debated in committee because they've already passed this bill multiple times in the past but this time around it does have a provision for dependents of e1 and e2 investors or treaty traders for h1b dependents and l1 dependents um, these are kids who came to the u.s before they were 18 and then have since aged out or will age out and are not able to get the green card with their parents. Um, so in that situation, they will actually allow you to receive a green card in the same way that the DACA kids and the TPS people would receive it. Wait, 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 Emily. I thought Democrats are only for unlawful people, not for legal people. <laughs> well, that's certainly been their priority, I think, over the years. So. Well, the whole thing, what I see in the CNN, the Fox News, is only speaking about unlawful people, but you're telling that any person who is in the United States, who were been uh, in the United States on H-4, and they got their H-4, L-2s, and some other dependent visas, they got into the country when they are under 18 years of age, and if they are here, of course, and if they are going to age out, they're going to become 21, they're going to get the green card? Correct. Now, there's some uh, provisions for that. They have to be in school or completed certain part of school, graduated high school or in college. Of course, if they've become 21, they would have done it mostly. Right. Okay? So I think a lot of these kids are probably already in F1 status at this point or considering so changing status to F1 before they turn 21. Uh, so they may be eligible for this. They had to be in the U.S. on or before January 1st, 2021. So there is a cutoff date. It's not going to work for someone who's coming now, okay. but for people who are already here. And interestingly, uh, there's even a provision for people who are outside the U.S. who had to leave because they aged out um, if they were in the U.S. Uh, previously and had to leave after January 2017 2018. when Trump came into power uh, as an odd date they chose there but um, they'll allow you to apply for the green card from outside the US if you fall under these provisions. So let me let me one more time if this bill is passed which seems to be that in house it has a good sponsorship and it's going to go through and of course you know Senate is where we are thinking we may have some hurdles but if it passes through Senate the kids who are in H4, then who are in L2 here right now, and they are going to, when they become 20, when they can, when they can file the green card application though. So they have to be over 21. To file. To file. So even if they are 18, when they become over 21, they'll file. Mm -hmm. And also for those people who move to the F1 visas, who were on H4 and L2 visas, and they move to F1, they can also file for the green card. Yeah. And you're also telling the people who left the country, they were here before January 1st of 2017 on H4 or L2, and even if they have become 21, let's say they are in India, they can file the green card application under this new bill. Mm -hmm. Wow, this yeah. is a good thing. Yeah, and there's no cap. I mean, there's no cap. And the thanks for the drafters of this. I have to always say thanks to Joe Lovgren. She 
must be part of this one. <laughs> I'm assuming that these kind of provisions can only come from the nice lady that I can ever, ever imagine. Uh, so that's good news for a lot of people, especially I know a lot of kids who are getting aged out, so they need to watch out for the bill. They need to support the bill. But what about the bill of removing the per country cap? Is that there in this bill, Emily? No, that didn't is we, not. Didn't we said it's a comprehensive bill? What is this bill then? Right, that's the thing. With all the, there are several bills uh, coming up in the House for a vote this week. None of them are the comprehensive bill. None of them are Biden's Citizenship Act of 2021. They're all piecemeal uh, pieces of legislation. So this is just for DACA, TPS and H4L2 dependent kids. There's another one for farm worker legalization. They're very small parts of uh, the big picture of immigration. So they're trying to move forward with those while we wait and see what happens so with the Biden's big bill. Approximately 400 pages has been split into pieces right now. But this still is good for us, uh, for the people. At least, you know, we have been treated equally compared to the uh, people who are unlawfully present in this country. So that's good. Uh, I would request all the people to support the bill. At the same time, we still need, uh, this is just a step one, we still need to work on the employment-based immigration bill, which removes the per country, lab, uh, per country limit, which increases the amount of green cards from 140,000 to 170,000, which exempt the family members, including the spouses and kids to be counted into the immigration cap, which also uses the unused green cards from 1992 to 2001 that were being thrown out because of the per country cap. Um, we still need to fight on those things, I think, so that will be the second, boy, second battle we have to face once we win this battle. This battle, the Democrats choose because they thought that it's an easy win battle, and then maybe the next battle is where we need to, we need to gather ourselves. But I recommend all the people to support this bill. Anything else, Emily, on this bill that you want to address? Nope. Um, Emily, recently we have seen Biden administration is changing the policy. Now, what is the policy he, he changed on visa stamping without an interview? Uh, can you explain that more? Yes, yeah, so this is also very good news for us. We have so many people that have not been able to get visa interview appointments because of COVID and consulate closures and travel bans. Um, so we've had the uh, visa waiver uh, Dropbox program that if your visa has expired within the last two years, uh, you may be able to uh, be able to apply for your new visa stamp without actually going in for an interview. Last week, that was actually extended to four years. So if your visa expired three years ago or three and a half years ago, um, you can still now use the Dropbox in order to get your new visa stamp in your passport and can avoid um, having to schedule that interview appointment, which is very backlogged and delayed. And that has been extended through December 31st. So through the rest of this year, uh, visa Dropbox eligibility has been expanded. And especially, I like the provision that visa expired within four years can apply for the Dropbox. That eases up a lot of the pressures on the consulate. These are the steps that the administration should have taken before to ease up the pressure with the COVID. There are people who don't want personal contact. Uh, at least the government employees, they don't want to have the personal contact though. Emily, on the visa bulletin now, this is the most complex thing with people. We will have to have a separate session this visa bulletin. But coming to the point, we have seen the priority date movements. Uh, finally, the adjustment of status for EB2 has moved to May 1st of 2010, which used to be the same thing about f exactly nine years ago on March for, in March of 2020, uh, March of 2012, which is nine years ago. It has reached and uh, EB3 has advanced. What do you expect going forward, Emily? Yeah, I think we'll see those dates and the final action dates continue to move slowly forward um, through the rest of this fiscal year. And then hopefully in October, we'll see another big jump uh, because again, we'll have those family-based green cards that have not been able to be issued due to travel bans. Plus we have the COVID consular closures. They're just not issuing green cards to family members, even though people are eligible now. Uh, so all of that should spill over to employment-based again in October. It's so hard to predict those. I mean, we all thought it's going to move very quickly um, because the whole idea of this filing dates chart, that's the prediction of where the final action dates should be by September. But then all of a sudden, the filing date went backwards. How is that possible? <laughs> and then the final dates didn't move forward. 
forward. But finally, I think the government's getting a handle on how many applicants are actually there and moving forward through those. I don't know if you have any thoughts on uh, predictions. I'm, I'm also expecting, Emily, that the USCIS, I'm noticing that they're approving the green card, especially for the EB-1 and certain people who are final action date is current, though. They're approving without the interview, which is very good. So that may expand a little bit more, and we may see a policy change uh, soon coming to reverse what the Trump administration has done in March of 2017, where they started interviewing everybody except in some of the cases, though. So I do expect more changes. I've seen, you know, uh, the the uh, prevailing wage increase has been delayed. The uh, uh, H-1B lottery system, based on the based on the higher wages has been uh, delayed uh, or, or canceled. There are a lot of things changes. Um, visa stamping has been expanded. Uh, Dropbox has been expanded from uh, two years to four years. There are a lot of changes coming in this administration. I may expect more good news coming on, uh, on, on, on how fast, how efficient this administration could be in processing the employment base. I'm expecting there may not be any wastage of the green cards in two, in the year of 2021, starting from October 1st of 2022, 2021, on the employment base, based on the speed at which they are going. Um, uh, one of the things that I want to address people is that when you have filed an adjustment of status application, if you are on L1 or H1 or L2 or H4 visa, if your visa is already stamped in the passport, if your adjustment of status is pending, you can go outside the country and come back using your passport visa. However, though, your advance parole, that is called I-131 application that you may have filed, if it's been pending, though, you have to consider that as if it has been denied. Even if the immigration by mistake approves that, I don't want you to rely on that. I want you to come and refile the I-131 application. If your adjustment of status is pending and your I-131, also called as advanced parole, is already approved, you have a choice. If you have the passport stamping, you can come by and come passport stamping. You don't have to use advanced parole. But if you don't have the passport stamping, you can come back and advance parole then you may consider that point of time under limit there are some exceptions available but mostly you may consider yourself that you are married to the adjustment of status application now there's nothing wrong in getting married to the adjustment of status but you may be foregoing your h1b and h4 now please consider that the main thing when people are using an advanced parole or when their people are using the ead the first thing that i want everybody to be get cleared is their i-140 should be approved now, previously, we used to get the I-140 approval and used to wait for a long time to file the adjustment of status. But in October of 2020, we filed adjustment of status to a lot of people who's, uh, whom we have downgraded from EB2 to EB3. So their I-140 is still pending. I strongly request that if you are going to use an EAD or advanced parole, I want you to get this I-140 approved. You can do premium processing. There are a lot of lawyers who are telling, oh, premium processing is not allowed. Premium processing for the downgrade is allowed. Yes, there are rejections that are coming in. Rejection doesn't mean that your I-140 is getting denied. They are sending your money back. But we are sending it back. So they are sending it back. After a couple of times, the USCIS get tired and takes our money. And they will then adjudicate the I-140 in the proper timing. So please keep on filing it. You want this I-140 to be cleared off. Also, there is a third way of traveling if your adjustment of status is pending and your advance parole is not approved and your passport stamping is not there for H1 or H4 or L1, L2. You can go to outside the country. You can get your H1 or L1 or H4 or H, uh, L2. You can get stamped in the passport and you can come back into the country. Your adjustment of status will be intact, will not happen anything. But your advance parole, if it's not approved before you left the country, you have to consider that that advance parole is denied. And once you come back, you can apply for that advance parole. Now, having said that, the EAD, even though you traveled outside the country and came back in, will be processed. 
will not hamper anything. You can use, if you want to use that EAD, you're welcome to use it. Uh, but it's just the advanced parole that you're, you should be more worried about. Uh, and uh, let me mention also, uh, Manas from Face uh, from YouTube had uh, asked a question about this. It reminded me about the 944 form. So the public charge rule is no longer. They've gone back to the old way of adjudicating public charge. So that means the 944 form does not need to be submitted if you're filing a 485 now. It also means on the I-129 and the I-539 application, which is for the H1, L1, um, H4, L2 applicants, you do not need to complete the questions that ask about your use of public benefits. Those can be left blank. Um, so that's good news for people filing those. I mean, for employment-based, it really wasn't um, that big of an issue, but it's just more things you have to worry about, not missing, uh, checking a box. That's, um, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, Sujana has this question. It's definitely, uh, she's from YouTube, and uh, it's not a legal question. It's just an opinion that she is asking. Um, my priority date is March 2016. I got a full-time offer from the end client. Do you recommend changing employer at this time? Considering fast moving of the GCEA, GCEB2. Well, you are using the word considering fast movement of GCEB2. Personally, Sujana, I would not move the jobs right now. With the perm labor certification, where the entire processing time used to take less than one year to get the e labor and I-140 approval, I mean, mostly about nine months it used to take, is now taking approximately one and a half to two years. Uh, and that too, if your end client is willing to process the green card as soon as you join the company. So if I were you, I would not. <laughs> I would not join the end client. Uh, some of the questions we cannot answer, we cannot tell what you should do, guys, because it's a judgment call. Uh, nothing wrong if you choose to go to the end client. I mean, is it illegal or illegal? You know, it's perfectly legal. You know that it's legal. I don't have to tell you that. You're just answering for a judgment call which way it could go. I'm going to just answer the question as if that I were the person in your shoes what would I do? I would not move if I were you. Uh, Sudhir from Facebook wants to know, can we file an I-140 petition and an H-1B extension at the same time? Um, possibly. So assuming that your H-1B extension is not going beyond the six-year limit, so it's not relying on that I-140, then yes, there's no problem with having an I-140 petition pending at one service center and an H-1B extension pending at another service center. They're completely separate processes. One does not depend on the other. Prash from YouTube has, uh, can I start using the I-485 EAD uh, and and H-1B is valid for more than two years. I, can I work for H-1B and EAD simultaneously for two different employers? Well, once you activate the EAD, you can get back to the H-1B, but technically speaking about, you are considered to be married to the EAD applications. There are ways to get the divorce from it and get back to H-1B. My main question for people who are in adjustment of status and EAD, which seems to be almost like 50% uh, of our audiences right now are on adjustment of status. Main question is that if your I-140 is approved, if it's been more than six months, what is your problem in using the EAD? Yes, there is a one in a hundred chance your uh, 485 could be denied. I'm not telling it could not be. But there are complications if you try to keep on filing H-1Bs. You have to maintain H-1B, you have to maintain the H-4, you have to maintain the H-4 EAD, you have to maintain every time you go outside the country, you have to get the stamping. What is your purpose of, uh, of all these things? If your only purpose is to make money for immigration lawyers, thank you, let me know that in advance. I may want to think about buying a Ferrari on your name. I wish I could. Now, if I were you guys, my purpose would be, I want you. Before I got the green card, I was a dependent, I was an H-4, I, got, I filed the adjustment of status. If I were you guys, I would get married to the adjustment of status. I don't want immigration lawyers to make money every year for every little thing. I don't want it. 
Now, if you move to the adjustment of status, the 48, if you move from one company to another company, you just file 485J supplement. The filing fees is how much? Zero. To file an EAD extension, the filing fees is how much? Zero. To file an advance parole extension, how much is the filing fees? Zero. Everything is zero. Of course, lawyers may charge a little bit, not much money, but when you maintain the adjustment of status, EAD, advance parole, H1B, I would not. You may want to consult a lawyer to see if there are any faults in it, uh, in your application, to see any judgment calls need to be made on it to maintain. Especially for the people who have kids who are teenagers, the bill is not passed, what Emily said. So if you have teenage kids, yeah, definitely you don't want to get married to the adjustment of status. You may have to maintain the other thing. For otherwise people, though, you may want to. If you have some doubts, have a consultation with a lawyer, go over the entire file to see if there is any potential problems that may arise instead of spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and live a miserable life of H1B. Believe me, H1B life is very miserable, very miserable. I lived a H4 life. I became a lawyer and I didn't have a work permit. That's how miserable it was. It is H1B, H4 are miserable compared to the adjustment of status, EADs, guys. That's my opinion. You may consult a lawyer. I know that there are a lot of lawyers who are telling, don't do this, keep on maintaining the H1Bs. I think so, their purpose is only to make money. Uh, because I can come with a background of being a client and I understand the immigration a little bit more than a lot more people because I was a client and I'm a lawyer too. I personally would like to get married to the adjustment of status. But two conditions have to be met. 180 days after adjustment of status has been filed. The second one is that the underlying I-140 must have been approved. Uh, Krishna from Facebook, his wife has been working on H-4 EAD and her employer is going to sponsor her for an H-1B in the cap this year. His H-1B is expiring in October and so his employer plans to file his H-1 extension in her H-4 extension even though she's also filing in this year's H-1 cap. Is there going to be a problem of having her H-4 extension and an H-1B pending at the same time? No, there's no problem with that. We had a lot of people in that same situation over the last couple of years. The main issue is making sure that you ultimately end up in the status that you want. So you have to be careful of the timing of the approvals. Uh, but th that, even that, if the timing is off and one gets approved, um, the, the wrong one gets approved and you end up in the wrong status, that can generally be easily fixed by traveling. Um, but no problem with having them pending at the same time. Can 485 be submitted for both wife and husband parallelly with different employers? This is Taluri from uh, YouTube. The answer is yes, absolutely. You can file both the adjustment of status. There may be, there may come a time where the USCIS might force you to withdraw one of the 485 application. That normally happens when they are about to approve one of the 485 application the officer will request, why don't you withdraw one of the application, I'm going to approve this one. And then we normally withdraw it, that happens. Uh, yeah, but there's nothing wrong in applying two applications at the same time. Um, AJ from YouTube plans to return back to his old employer and that employer withdrew his I-140 and he wants to know um, if he returns back to the same job, do they need to refile a new perm and I-140? Um, actually, the I-140 can be refiled, uh, the one that was withdrawn. You don't have to worry about the fact that the labor certification has expired. They can simply file another I-140 using the expired labor certification, assuming that the details of the job listed on that labor certification remain the same. Pratyush has this question. Does the lock, locks, lock box extension apply for change of status? She is now on H-1B, she was on a different visa, can she use the lockbox? The answer, Pratisha, is no. The previous visa stamping that you got must be of the same category though. Not, so if you got a stamping on H-4 or F-1 and now you're applying for the H-1B visa, you are not eligible for the lockbox. There are a lot of people who ask the question, I moved from company A to company B. Am I still eligible for the lockbox? If you have got the previous visa from the US consulate in India with a different company and now you change to a different company, 
and your passport visa has expired by less than four years, you are still eligible for the uh, lockbox. Dropbox, sorry, not dro lockbox, dropbox. Uh, Srinivas from YouTube, his priority date is October 2009 and it's current. He applied for the adjustment of status in October, received receipt notices, but no further progress. What is the best way to speed it up? Um, unfortunately, there really isn't any. Um, USCIS does take its time with the process even when the priority date is current. Um, you know, you have to look at what the current processing times are and if your case is within normal processing times, which it surely is, um, you can't even do a service request at this point. You just have to wait it out. Emily, I may need your assistance in this question from Kumar from Facebook, Emily. Can he apply under the master's quota when he is in the final last semesters of the master's? Previously, uh, in 2007, 2000, uh, uh, you know, in the previous, we used to get a letter from the university that he has completed all the coursework and we used to submit that when we are filing the H-1B in the master's quota though. Now, we are just applying on the lottery and the rule says that you must be eligible on the day you apply. Now does it mean when we apply in the lottery or when we apply for the uh, H-1B? The good news is it's when you apply for the H-1B. So assuming that you're comfortable that you will in fact complete your degree this semester and graduate before June 30th, your lottery registration can be submitted under the master's cap and then you will hold off filing the H-1B petition until you have the degree certificate or can get a letter from the registrar confirming that you finished your degree while you're waiting for the diploma and file the H-1B by June 30th. Uh, Leah has this question. Leah Lisbon has this question. Have you seen any approval of the I-140 in regular processing for downgrade applications? No, I have not seen any approvals. I have seen a lot of people converting into premium processing and getting approved, but not in a regular processing. Typically, when we file a downgrade application, though, since a previous labor certification and I-140 has already been filed, the processing time takes a lot longer than the normal, regular processing. Please be aware of it. Um, Suri from YouTube wants to know, what happens to the green card numbers that were spilled over from the family-based category last year if USCIS fails to use them for employment-based this year? Will they go wasted? Uh, unfortunately, yes, they 100% will go to waste. Um, so hopefully USCIS will be speeding up the processing and getting through those so we don't have any wasted green cards. Would primary applicant and H-4 uh, kids be considered as married if the spouse uses a 485 application, a 485 EAD? No, uh, the main applicant in this and the kids are not considered to be married though. Uh, they can, uh, that, uh, Chandra, you, you may have a unique issues because especially the, when the H4 kids are there, age of is there, you don't want to get married. You don't want your kids to get married, but it's okay if your wife is getting married to the adjustment of status EAD. That's okay because you and your kids will still be maintaining the H1 and H4. Rupika from YouTube um, had previously received a 221G when applying for an F1 visa and is now applying for an H1B visa stamp. In the DS-160, um, she wants to know, do you have to select yes, was your visa ever rejected? Uh, yes, a 221G, although it's administrative processing and it gives you the opportunity to overcome it, it is technically a rejection of a visa, so you do need to answer yes to that question. Question for uh, uh, Mayank Singh from YouTube has this question. Um, moving from H1 to H4 EAD because of the six year limit, can he get back to H1B after PERM and I-140 has been approved? Yes, you can. Uh, the, your friend can, absolutely, that should not be a problem. You, should, you can move to H4 plus EAD and on H4 EAD, people can file the PERM application and once the I-140 is approved, you can move back to the H-1B. 
Um, Radhika from Facebook wants to know, what's the maximum a lot of time um, someone can stay outside the U.S. while on an H-1B, such as taking a vacation? There's technically no maximum, but when you are returning to the U.S., uh, you do have to demonstrate that the job offer is still there for you. Um, so if it's an extremely long period of time, you may be questioned about that when you're coming back. Um, but there is technically no maximum on that. A uh, question from Ultra from Facebook. What happens to the, all the 944s <laughs> that we submitted along with the 485 application? Oh, that was a nightmare for us to file the 944s, believe us. So many questions, so many documents, educational documents, financial documents. Oh my goodness, I get to see a lot of people's uh, <laughs> Uh, what is that, uh, Robin Hood accounts. Uh, a lot of strange things that I've seen in those things. Yeah, they will be completely ignored right now. Um, they are not going to look into it. That was a nightmare for us uh, in those October and November months. They will be ignored, they will not be considered right now. That's good news. Gunter from uh, YouTube has a valid H-4 visa and recently applied for the H-4 EAD in November um, and wants to know how long it's taking to get the EAD approved. Uh, right now, I would say anywhere from six to eight months is pretty standard for the EAD when it's filed by itself and not based on a pending, for, um, pending I-539. Oh, this question comes from Manoj. Um, can you get an EAD if your priority date is backlogged? Yes. Once you are in adjustment of status and you file the adjustment of status in proper time, absolutely. Even if the priority date goes backlogged, your EAD will be adjudicated. Uh, Ishwar has this question. Can primary stay on H-1B and dependent use GCEAD? Yes, that is possible. There's nothing wrong. But Ishwar, one question that I have is that you're thinking that if something wrong happens with a 485, you want H-1B to save you. Yes, that is the reason why you want to maintain the H-1B. I don't see any other reason. Now, would you be willing to get the green card without your wife? That's my question. If not, what is the purpose for you to maintain the H-1B? Uh, no. I personally, I don't know, I don't like H-1Bs, but anyway, people insist upon making immigration lawyers rich. Lokesh from Facebook, um, his wife applied for an H-4 and H-4 EAD, and then she left to go to India and got the H-4 stamped and wants to know what can be done to inform USCIS that they don't need the biometrics. Um, unfortunately, USCIS doesn't care. They still think that she needs the biometrics. Um, so they'll schedule her for biometrics, and if she's not back in the U.S. for that, they could deny the H-4, which can then lead to the H-4 EAD being denied. So my recommendation generally is once you come back in H-4 status, refile the EAD so you don't have to waste time waiting for a denial on the first one. Satish has this question. Is it advisable to downgrade from EB-3 to EB-2 while the priority date is in 2016? Will the date of filing in October 2021, he put a different word there, but I'm changing it to 2021, uh, will, be, will, will it be final action dates or filing dates for the 485? First question is Santosh, is, uh, Satish is from YouTube is, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to file the downgrade application from AB2 to AB3 right now. The only reason I may be doing it, I, I don't know if my employer will make a big fuss at the time when the priority dates become correct. What if your employer says, I am not going to downgrade your application, then you're screwed up at that point of time. If your employer is doing downgrade for all the other people, especially he might have done in October, then personally, if I were you, I would not downgrade the application. I will wait when the priority date becomes current, and then I'm going to file an I-140 and adjustment of status. This is the same thing what we said about a one and a half year ago in the downgrade application video that we made. But 
if the employer is like kind of he has not done it, he doesn't know what to do, I want to test the waters right now to see if he's going to downgrade or if he's going to create a problem. If he's new for all these things, I would get the downgrade application because I don't know what he's going to do later on. When coming to projection after two, October 2021, Visa Bulletin, uh, will the U.S. accept the filing dates or final action dates? Uh, tough questions to you, Emily. <laughs> um, generally, you know, we've had these filing dates for the past uh, six years now, and generally October is the most likely month that we do get to use the filing dates charts. Um, so I'm you know, obviously we can't guarantee anything, but I would expect that we should be able to use filing charts in October. CP Sinha has a good exception from YouTube, though. I have filed my 485 application in October. He is not married. He's contemplating on getting married. Can I add my spouse to the green card application? Oh, I don't want you to get married to the adjustment of status, Mr. CP Sinha. The reason is that if your spouse is in USA on a different non-immigrant visa status, when the dates become current, you can add her. The problem here is that what if your spouse is in India? I mean, what if you get married in India? You want to bring her here. You can't bring her if you get married to the adjustment of status. You have to maintain the H-1B. In your case, Mr. C.P. Sinha from YouTube, I would recommend you maintain the H-1B. Don't get married to the adjustment of status, otherwise your second marriage to the other girl will become a problem. You stay unmarried on H-1B. Uh, that is my recommendation uh, though. So if I were you, I will not get married. I will maintain the H-1B so that I will have the option of the H-4 for my spouse at any point of time. If you get married, you lose the option of H-4, which becomes very very, very complicated if you want to get your wife, uh, get, get, if you want to get your wife to USA, it's very complicated. Sven K1985 from YouTube wants to know, if we switch to the EAD and AP from H1B, what is the EAD AP renewal process like? Are there any risks, any time that you can't travel or employment uh, during the renewal time? Good question. Um, so you can file the EAD AP renewal up to 120 days prior to your current EAD and AP expiring. You file the I-765 and the I-131 application. Once it's filed, the good news is your employment authorization is automatically extended from the time your current EAD expires for an, another 180 days. So if you file 120 days early, um, then your EAD expires, you get another six months of processing time to get the new one approved so that you don't run out of employment authorization time. So it's very rare for someone to have a gap in employment authorization uh, based on their pending adjustment of status application. Now the AP renewal, um, if you travel while an AP renewal is in process, that AP may get denied. So there are some restrictions a little bit on travel there. It doesn't negatively impact your adjustment of status. Um, well, it would at that point if you are already on married to the adjustment of status and no longer have the H-1B. So yes, there can be some travel restrictions, but generally no employment restrictions. Uh, my, uh, Mr. Reddy from YouTube has this question. My previous H-1B stamping is from Malaysia. It expired in August of 2018. Will I be able to avoid the Dropbox option from India? Unfortunately, no. Your previous stamping must have gotten from India only. If you get it from other country, you are not eligible for the Dropbox. Uh, Jace from Facebook has an I-485 EAD and AP approved along with an H-1B that's valid till 2024 and wants to know if there's any complications in changing employers. 
Well, in order for you to be able to continue your green card process with the new employer, the new job offer has to be in the same or similar occupational category as the job that you were sponsored for for the green card. And your new employer has to file an I-485 Supplement J. That has to be signed by both you and the new employer. And the new job does have to be permanent employment. It can't be independent contractor. It can't be part-time. Um, but other than that, um, it's relatively simple to change employers by filing that Supplement J. You have the option of also filing an H-1B transfer, but that's not necessary if you decide to be married to the adjustment of status. Mag from YouTube has this question. Um, the end client is the end client letter needed for the Dropbox in India? Uh, one caveat, I mean, technically speaking, I want to answer the question, though. You may not require a drop box, uh, you may not require an end client letter for the drop box. It's not an absolute necessary document. Just like the way your passport is an absolute necessary document, it's not. However, please be on, on that. The drop box doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to get the visa in the drop box. They could always call you for the interview and then request at that point of time the end client letter though. So it is a possibility they can ask you to come for the interview, but in the Dropbox itself, it's not a necessary document. Uh, Leah from Facebook wants to know if you've had any success in including the biometrics from a downgrade application with an H-4 application to expedite the H-4 and EAD processing time. We have started doing this, but it's too soon for us to have any results from it. Uh, but we will definitely keep you posted if we see, if we start getting notifications that they are reusing those biometrics from the downgrade um, with the adjustment of status that was filed in October, we will let you know. Question from uh, Lunapan. Uh, we are going to India, but our kids' H4 extension is not approved. Can we take them to India? Shall we go, them for, the, uh, shall we go for the consulate for H1B extension? Yes, absolutely. You do not need the H-4 extension of your kids to be approved for you to take them to the consulate for stamping. Absolutely not required. You can use your H-1B approval or your husband's H-1B approval to get the kids H-4 extension even though their extension is pending, even though their extension is not approved. You do not need that document at all. All you need is either yours or your spouse H-1B approval for your kids to get the H-4 extension approved. Varun from Facebook says his sister filed an I-130 petition for him in January of 2019. He got the receipt number, but when checking the case status, all it does is show received. Um, it's still not approved. What are the next steps? That's entirely normal. Um, because the priority date is nowhere near being current, USCIS does not prioritize the processing of these types of I-130 petitions. It may be pending for years. They're not going to look into it until it's closer to the priority date being approved. Nothing to worry about there. Uh, this question comes from Sen Abhijit from Facebook. If I move to H-1B to GCEAD in May or June, which is probably after 180 days, if I travel, can I return back on H-1B? Uh, he has a stamping in the passport, which is valid until October. Here is my problem, though. When you're coming back, uh, the main question is that, are you still working for the H-1B company? If you're still working for the H-1B company, then what do you mean by you are using GCEAD? If you're not working for the H-1B company, when you're coming back, you're showing the H-1B. When you're showing the H-1B, you're telling you're going to work for the company, you have a job for the company, in which case you don't have it. That's the reason why you use a GCAD. There are exceptions available, uh, Mr. Abhijit, and of what I spoke, but in general, uh, if you are not using the H-1B, if you're not working the, uh, the H-1B job, you can't use that H-1B to come into the United States. That definitely will be a wrongful entry into the United States. Uh, Tripathi from YouTube filed the I-485 downgrade, um, but it was unfortunately rejected. His wife also has an EB-2 with a June 2013 priority date and wants to know if he can file another 485 with his wife's company and also refile his. 
Um, so you can file another 485 when your wife's priority date is current, as long as you both have maintained your non-immigrant status all the way up until the time that that priority date becomes current. Um, and you do have the option of trying to refile yours um, if it was rejected for um, an improper reason. USCIS is looking into that issue and has started accepting some of those rejected uh, petitions from last October. Uh, Nagman has Facebook as, I have scheduled a visa interview in Hyderabad for Dropbox, not visa interview, I mean Dropbox. Is there a chance for cancellation? We have noticed a lot of cancellations previously, especially before Let's say November of 2020, we've seen a lot of cancellations. Starting from February of 2000, or January of 2021 though, we haven't observed very many cancellations. Um, nevertheless, I would want you to travel one week before uh, your schedule. I don't want you to travel like one month before. I would rather want you to travel uh, maybe four days, five days before your biometrics appointment. In that way, if there is any cancellations, then you can accommodate yourself in your plans of what you want to do. Uh, don't plan, don't go well in advance there. Usha from Facebook has a 2011 priority date but changed employers and the new employer has not started the process yet and wants to know what happens if that priority date becomes current. Um, so when that priority date becomes current, if you don't have uh, the new labor certification approved, you won't be able to file your adjustment of status. Um, and the difficulty is you are limited from that point um, with extending your H-1B. If you've been beyond the six-year limit and you keep extending your H-1B in three-year increments based on AC-21, that um, benefit goes away once the priority date becomes current. You're then only allowed to get a one-year extension. So depending on the timing of when the priority date becomes current and how much time is left on your H-1B, um, you may have a short window to get your new labor certification approved to be able to file the I-140 and 485. This question comes from RK from YouTube. Can we port current priority date from a software developer to a managerial role from one I-140 to another I-140. If you're going to file another perm and another I-140, and you want to port the date, the previous job does not have to be any way related to the new job, though absolutely not required. Now, when you want, when you're in adjustment of status and you're filing a 485J supplement, it's completely different. It has to be in a similar profession. But if you're porting from one I-140 to another I-140 and you're filing a new labor certification, the jobs can be completely different. How different can they, can they be? Can it be a software developer to a lawyer? Yes, it can be. Can it be a lawyer to doctor? Yes, it can be. And your, uh, your priority date will still be ported. It doesn't have to be in the same profession. Rahul from YouTube wants to know if there's any update on I-539 premium processing. No specific updates from USCIS, but this is something that the American Immigration Lawyers Association brought up to the USCIS Ombudsman Office last week. They had a liaison meeting, and they talked about a lot of the issues that um, USCIS has not moved forward on, um, customer service being a big problem, and they did request that USCIS start implementing these expanded premium processing opportunities. So hopefully the USCIS ombudsman will bring that back to USCIS and we'll get moving on that. Uh, Santosh Straws from YouTube has, what happens depending on I-140 application if the company splits into new companies formed? Wow, that's... Depends on how splitting happened, depending on who takes what the responsibility is. There is, if you move to a different tax ID number than the tax ID number where you're getting the checks, you may be forced to file another I-140 application. That's for sure, I can tell. In some cases, you may have to file the entire PAM application and I-140 application, both of them. I have the question from Syed, Mr. Syed from YouTube. Do you anticipate perm processing time to improve in the next six to 12 months? 
No, I don't think so. There are a lot of issues on the prevailing wage issues. There is a SOC code changes that are coming in. I am not anticipating, Mr. Syed, if I were you, I want you to plan the things around as if that it's not going to be approved within the time period that you're planning. There are a lot of people that are coming near to the sixth year that come at the end. They come like two months before, three months before. What do I do? What do I do? I'm getting six years of it. Have a consultation with a lawyer, maybe nine months, maybe 11 months, maybe 12 months right now. There are some creative ways where you can extend the six year life. Believe me, I tell people, hey, do one thing. Keep on traveling to Mexico, stay there 25 days, come back here, stay there 25 days, come back here. In that way, they can extend their H-1B. There are some people who can go, who, if you're eligible from H-4, they can move to H-4. If they have a passport stamping, hey, go stay there for two months or three months in India and come back. If the company allows you to work from there, if you have 11, there are many, many creative ways where you can extend the six years of the H-1B without violating a law. You can extend the six year time limit so that you know you can comply with the I-140 approval. Don't come to me two months before your six year expires and bang your head on me. Come to a, go to a lawyer well in advance as soon as possible because a lot of people were anticipating that their labor and I-140 would be getting approved from zero start to finish within eight months. Yes, it used to happen before, now it's anywhere between one and a half to two years. So be prepared for that well in advance. Don't, you know, don't come at the end of the two months to any lawyer. Karen from Facebook, his spouse lost her job in July of last year due to COVID um, and filed a change of status from H1 to H4 with the H4 EAD that's of course still pending. And at the same time, or a couple months later, everybody filed their um, I-140 downgrade and adjustment of status in October. And now she has a job offer and he wants to know, should we wait for the H-4 EAD, the green card EAD, or file an H-1B um, to get back to work and pull back the H-4 pending application? Well, you don't want to withdraw the pending H-4 application because that's what's keeping her in a period of authorized stay from July 2020 till now. Um, if you withdraw that, that's kind of the bridge, and the bridge is going to collapse. Um, it may be tough to get the H-1 at this point because what we're seeing right now is if you filed a uh, change of status from H-1 to H-4 and then it's still pending and you file a change of status from H-4 back to H-1, you'll get an RFE asking for the H-4 approval notice. Well, with H-4 processing times, that's going to take a long time and USCIS is ultimately approving the H-1B but without an I-94 because they, you weren't maintaining um, H-4 status yet at the time of filing the H-1B. Um, so you may have an easier time waiting for either the H-4 EAD or the green card EAD. And otherwise, she would have to travel and get an H-1B visa stamp uh, to get back to work. Vishwatharya has this question. Indian passport re has been renewed. Am I still eligible for the Dropbox? Yes, you are still eligible for the Dropbox. A lot of people ask this question about the passport renewal, guys. Um, passport renewal in the U.S. law does not affect anything at all, actually. I know the Indian consulates are terrible. I mean, they're just horrible when you renew the passport. When it comes to the US consulate, the CBP, the USCIS, it does not affect anything whatsoever at all. You're fine. You have the passport renewal, you are still eligible. But whenever you submit the passport to anybody, I want you to submit both passports, the old passport and new passport. Whenever I see a client coming to me with two passports, I tell them to look that side. When they look that side, I staple their back side of the passports. In that way, they don't separate the passport that has the stamping, the one that doesn't have the stamping. So if you're otherwise eligible just because of your Indian passport renewal, will not have any effect whatsoever at all on the Dropbox. RK from YouTube wants to know if you can port uh, the current priority date for one job to a new I-140 if the new job is different. For example, he was previously a developer on that I-140 and the new role is a manager. 
Yes, absolutely no problem with that. Um, the retention of the priority date has nothing to do with job titles or job duties. Once you have any approved I-140, you can retain the date on a future I-140 for any other job. Mr. Uh, S. Reddy has this question. My son is 18 years old. I have downgraded I-140 EB3 and applied for EAD. What are the chances for the Dream Act to uh, protect a, a Dream and Protection Act getting passed? Well, it definitely has good chances to get passed in the House. We have to wait and see. Uh, we'll have to see. Probably next week we'll come to know how it's going to be presented to the Senate. I definitely want this bill to be passed. Uh, you know, uh, I want you, of course, you are the main beneficiary for this one. You should support this bill too. Write a letter to the congressman, write a letter to the senator from your local area and try to contact them and then write a letter to them to pass this bill. That you support this bill, you explain it. If possible, have your son write a letter to them too. Hey, this is my situation and that really affects the congressman. Just because you are not a voter doesn't mean anything. You are still the subject of the congressman or the senator. You still have a right to petition to the Congress you can. Mudasir from YouTube wants to know, now that the I-944 is not needed, do you think I-485 processing times will improve? Good question. Uh, yeah, great question. I think, I don't think that will have that much of an impact because the real delay for the I-485 processing times is the interview requirement and COVID and the high volume of filing that happened in October. And none of those things have gone away yet. Hopefully USCIS will reverse its position on requiring interviews for most employment-based visa applicants. That is truly what caused all of these processing times to get so out of whack and then COVID just added a whole new level to it. Um, hopefully with the 944, that's one less thing that officers will have to worry about, but I don't think that was the main culprit. Although I think so that it is a good effort that administration has done towards and the attitude that this administration is showing towards immigration is being friendly, practical, and probably, you know, eliminate the bad guys, but, you know, don't suffer the good guys. Uh, it's definitely a positive step, step what they have taken of taking out the I-94, which was a nightmare uh, for a lot of people, and filling the things out is a lot of, a lot of paperwork has been reduced. Hopefully so, they will also do the changes what Emily has pointed out. Uh, will pending speeding ticket uh, cause any effects for the drop box? No, pending speed ticket won't cause anything for the drop box, but make sure that it doesn't go to an arrest warrant. Sometimes if you don't miss the payment, do something, it may go to the arrest warrant and that may come to the consulate as if that, ooh, an arrest has been pending, which is not a big deal, but um, but technically speaking of Mr. Chinu uh, from YouTube, uh, it won't affect your Dropbox stamping, no, if it's just a speeding ticket. Um, Shravani from YouTube has an H-1B that's maxing out soon and the perm is still pending, H-1B extension is pending, and wants to know if you can apply for a change of status to H-4 and EAD. Um, you can, yes, that's a good option. If you are maxing out of H-1B time and you are married to another H-1B holder, you can switch to H-4, um, but uh, there's some difficulty with that because your H-1B extension is currently pending. You may want to upgrade that to premium processing to get that approval and then immediately file the change of status to H-4, assuming that you're not beyond the six-year limit at that point. Uh, Venkatesh has this question. If you apply for a right to information, does the employer come to know? Uh, most probably you might be speaking about your I-140 uh, application. No, your employer will not come to know, uh, especially uh, I don't think so of any circumstances where your employer can come to know that if you have filed and right to information. They should not and they will not come to know about it. Anything else, Emily? Well, I guess we're getting close to uh, 6 o'clock, so. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, 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 guys, the next one will be next Tuesday. Uh, every week we come and present uh, the weekly updates, business immigration updates that you need to know to keep on top of yourself. Please subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, 
and please hit the like button so that uh, other people like you can look into these things.